Cars are an excellent transport solution because you can drive an almost unlimited distance with them. And that's because there's a global network for distributing propellant or fuel. But imagine if that network didn't exist and you had to tow around all the fuel that you'd ever need. That uh, fuel would extend maybe 100 yards down. That's a lot of fuel. It's impossible to think about throwing away a car after it's used up its first tank of gas. But that is the reality that we live with in the space industry today. I've lived this, uh, this frustration personally. A company that I set up in 2011, we tried to buy the AM4 satellite. The satellite cost $400 million to build and should have brought in $6 billion of revenue. But there was a glitch with the launch vehicle and it got put into the wrong orbit. And it didn't have enough fuel for us to take it where we needed it. Because we couldn't get any more fuel, we had to destroy that satellite to avoid it becoming dangerous debris. Now, this isn't an isolated incident. This happens all the time. In the last decade, almost 200 satellites worth about a billion dollars, sorry, a hundred billion dollars, have had to be destroyed because they've run out of fuel. But now we have the opportunity to recover billions of dollars of lost revenue. My name's Daniel Faber, and I'm the CEO of Orbit Fab. We're building gas stations in space. I've spent 22 years in the space industry. I've built about uh, a dozen satellites, several successful products. This is my fourth startup company. I have lived with the frustration of having only one tank of gas for far too long. It is time to stop throwing satellites away. Here's what we do. We build tanks. We put them onto any available launch vehicle, so we get the best deal putting them into space. In space, we manage the logistics and the orbital mechanics, and we deliver the right fuel to our customers when they need them. Our customers can save 50% on their capital expenditure, and we take home gross margins of 90%. Now, you may ask, why hasn't this been done? There's a catch-22 here. No system exists for safely and reliably fueling a satellite in space. So we set out to solve that problem first. A famous science fiction author, Robert Heinlein, once said, once you can get to low Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system. So we like to think that what we've built is the key to the solar system. This is a gas cap. <laughs> this fueling port allows satellites to be refueled safely and reliably in orbit. It's not as simple as you might think. When you look at the fluids that are, uh, that are flowing in orbit, gravity doesn't take them away. So the surface tension and other effects are complicating how fluids behave. We solve that problem and many other problems. So back to the presentation, what you'll see here is uh, the fueling port and a, uh, an active half that allows us to connect. So we've developed these, and uh, Jeremy here in the demonstration is showing the active half. The robotic arms on this, the, the small arms on the side, they close around the fueling port, giving it a lot of alignment uh, tolerance, a lot of self-alignment. So NASA has been researching this problem, and they've developed a very good solution which assumes that you have expensive, complex robots that can line up the fueling ports to connect them. But we see a future which is a bustling space economy, where satellites can come and dock and depart without the need for very expensive robotic uh, gas station attendants. So it works. By coming into proximity of the satellite, the arms close around the fueling port, and then we can transfer high-pressure propellant. When the transfer is done, the spacecraft is released. It goes off to an orbit where it can make more money for its owners. Back to the presentation. This fueling port has been built at a small size, a small weight, small cost, the same exactly as the fill ports that they currently use to fill up satellites on the ground with their first tank of gas. But this one can be refueled on orbit. Because this is a drop-in replacement, we're getting rapid customer adoption. We've already flown these to the International Space Station, uh, a lot of our technologies. So what you see here are two tanker test beds. We transferred a fluid between the two to test our pumps and our valves. In this case, it was using water. 
And when we'd finished that, we hooked our system up to the International Space Station. And as reported in TechCrunch, we became the first private company to resupply the space station with water. Now, those went up full of water and came back to us just last week empty. And the unit here that you see is the very same unit that was on the International Space Station just a few weeks ago. In case you think that this is a science experiment, let me assure you, we worked with 20 companies to develop a standard fueling port. They're all looking for a standard. We've sold already to two customers. We'll be shipping uh, about 10 fueling ports in the next few weeks. We have contracts signed with the US Air Force, with Japanese conglomerate IHI, a partnership with Lockheed Martin, and many other deals. So the team that's put this together, uh, you've heard my background. My last company was building small thrusters to go into satellites. Uh, that was acquired last December. Uh, Jeremy, my co-founder, he's an international business background. He's the vice chair at an indus industry association backed by DARPA that is working to standardize satellite servicing. And our brilliant young engineer, James, has five payloads on the International Space Station, has built three satellites, and he built our hardware for the space station in only four and a half months. Wrap it up. OrbitFab is building the next layer of infrastructure for the space industry. So if your companies are building satellites, come and talk to us about the future. I'd like to share with you the fueling port. All right, questions? So 90% gross margins are impressive, but um, as with any hardware business, particularly one that's in space, I would have thought this would be pretty capital intensive. So can you tell us a little bit more about the costs and your capital fundraising plans over the next few years? Yeah, really glad you asked about that, uh, that. Because of the experience that I have in the industry, I know where a lot of the inefficiencies are. And so I've been able to, to find ways to do this very cheaply. The flights that we had to the International Space Station were covered by the International Space Station National Lab. A shout out to CASIS for anyone who knows them. Uh, and the astronaut time was also a part of that. They're helping American industry to commercialize space in a, in a really big way. So that's one of the ways that, uh, that we've been able to do this. So I've obsessed about minimum viable product, how to bring this to the space industry, and our capital requirement is two or three orders of magnitude lower than, uh, than what others have considered necessary to get into this business. Which is how much, roughly? Uh, we expect to need about 20 million of capital total to, uh, to fully build out the system. Is that 20 million of a work, your first working system, and then you need more after that, or is that all you need? 20 million is to get the positive cash flow. Okay. Um, so we would continue to build out the system as customer demand grows, but that's the initial system. Okay. Are, are you selling these to people who are then bringing them to the satellites, or are you responsible for getting these to the satellites? So this is a, a system that would be adopted by the satellites, um, would then be launched into orbit. So we work with a lot of customers who are operating effectively tow trucks, satellite servicing vehicles, that can go and deal with the legacy system. So they've developed the complex robotics and everything that's needed for a system that wasn't designed to be serviced. Our system is designed to service them, so the tow truck can be refueled and can do a lot more uh, work. Uh, also, future satellites being equipped with these systems can then directly get refueled. So your system can work with legacy satellites but so not directly but through yeah. the the satellite servicing companies okay. and uh, and those companies they're building these tow trucks uh, it's like buying a new tow truck they can tow three cars but they've only got one tank of gas they have to throw the tow truck away and buy another tow truck by working with us we can deliver them fuel they can now tow tens or hundreds of of satellites completely changes the economics so those 30 companies that are working to bring that to market are all very keen to work with us we have a lot of deals how do you think about sort of I guess the unit economics of it. It's 20 million, I think, to create the product. You said maybe to get a cash flow break even, uh, but a per launch sort of economics, like how much does it cost to prepare that one system, get it into orbit, refill, and then do what you do with it. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, a very important part of our business model. So because we know the launch companies and we can work deals with them, we also have a payload that's very risk tolerant and schedule tolerant. So we can, we can be uh, a payload that fits in when there's an opportunity. And that way we can be very low cost in getting fuel to orbit. Whereas the, the customers who have the satellites, if they're putting fuel inside their satellite, they're paying the premium rate to make sure they launch on time exactly the way that they need. So we're actually able to get some really good deals with the launch companies and that gives us a leg up. You can think of us as third class mail. <laughs> 
So is there, can you talk a little bit more about the capital requirements in terms of like, is there a proof of concept or something you do with less capital that will prove to folks that they should give you the rest of it or do you need it all at one time? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely staged. In fact, you can see the, the unit that we sent to the International Space Station here. The plumbing in here, the tanks, the valves, etc., are exactly the same as what we will have on our minimum viable product tanker. We take this tanker exactly this size, we put solar rays, an off-the-shelf avionics package, and this becomes our first operational tanker. So we expect to launch that first operational tanker early next year. And how much do you need for, to get to that milestone? So we've just signed a seed round. Shout out to Tarek Waked from Type 1 Ventures. Um, and that seed round is $3 million. Okay. Um, that, will, that will cover the launch of that first tanker. And you think that the proof from that will enable you to get other customers to say... That's They're absolutely in? right, okay. yeah. And we have customers uh, lining up. By the end of next year, we intend to do a full end-to-end -end fuel sale demonstration uh, with a, in partnership with one or two of the customers, and that will open the floodgates then to be able to, to sign contracts. Um, the picture showed the um, box of water inside the station, but I assume this is going to live outside. So... I guess, have you tested it to make sure the water or won't freeze? Yeah, really good question. So having a lot of experience in the industry, we've done the designs to make sure that the thermal and the stress and, uh, and the vacuum are all going to be uh, acceptable with this design. Uh, and like I said, we need to add some systems to this, the solar rays, avionics, etc., before it can be a free-flying tanker. Um, so yeah, we've done those designs. We've started to do the testing. That's all planned for the next six to nine okay. months. And a really quick final question. All right, give it up for Orbit Fast! Thank you. Thank you.